Okay, it's time for our aviation segment, Clear for Takeoff with Rich Kaplan. Take it away, Rich. Thank you, Howie. This week I brought a um, friend from New Jersey. He's an aviation expert like myself, um, Al. AJ, tell us about aviation in New Jersey and what makes it so unique. Well, you know what? I always say that every state has their own you know, personality for anything, including aviation. Now, there's a lot of things about you know, New Jersey where you know, aviation has been pioneered. Now, you figure, look at World War II, uh, World War II era. Lots of the airports that are in New Jersey were Air Force Base or Naval Aviation Bases. Um, look at Millville, or near me. It was America's first defense airport, and they had the P-47 Thunderbolts flying out of there, and those, those basically were the ones that was protecting our country, so it was like our Air National Guard. Um, Newark Airport is, you know, one of the New York City major airports, and, and um, basically it was the first airport, it was actually, when it first came in, built, it was New York Metropolitan Airport, and Mayor of the City, Fiorello LaGuardia, said that he didn't want to land in New Jersey, so he wanted to have his own airport in the city, so that's how LaGuardia came about. Um, now, there's also, you have Teterboro, which is like the, the New York City major business hub for all corporate jets. Teterboro, that's the, like the busiest one, you know, followed by Farmingdale, New York, so. But there's one thing that New Jersey had that, you know, not too many people realize was the Hindenburg disaster. Now, people, a lot of people were always, you know, wondering about how the Hindenburg crashed because, yes, it was coming in from a storm. However, it was actually built to withstand the storm for landing. But what happened was, the uh, I guess it was like really windy, and the um, captain of the ship and that instead of coming in with the wind, he ended up doing a sharp turn, which destroyed some wires, which punctured a hole in it, and that's when lightning struck the uh, ship and. That's basically how the whole disaster came about. So, you know, New Jersey has a lot of things to offer when it comes to aviation, World War II, especially during the World War II era. That's when, you know, we, um, we came to shine. And now we have, you know, two commercial airports, Atlantic, actually we have three commercial airports, Atlantic City International, Trenton Mercer, and Newark. And Newark right now ranks number four, I believe, in international transportation. You know, JFK number one, Miami number two, LA number three, and Newark number four. And they just received a couple of new airlines like Emirates, Cathay Pacific. You know, so they have a lot of major, they, they're, ma they're a major player in the international aviation field. And their main hub is United, which basically flies all over the world. And FedEx is their cargo hub. So they have a, a lot of you know, planes that go all over the world too, so that's about it, so. Now you guys are gonna be getting in Newark in September, I believe, you're getting uh, Singapore SQ-2122, which is gonna be the longest flight in the world, nonstop from New York to Singapore. How significant is that to an airport like Newark? And more importantly, what benefits do you see that having for Newark and also for New Jerseyans in general? Well, see, we actually had that flight originally, but then I guess because the, the um, A3, A3 4500, which was getting old up in age, they, you know, they took that, that was, you know, no, they no longer could fly that. So right now they're coming back with the A350 900. And in my opinion, I think it's awesome that you have such a huge, you know, 19 and a half hour world record title. I mean, it's good for the New York area. It's good for the state of New Jersey. And to me, I, th I think it's awesome that we have a flight that goes 19 and a half hours each way. So, I mean, of course, you know, I don't know how people would actually like to sit on a plane for 19 and a half hours without getting bored. But you know what? To me, I think that's cool. I think it's really awesome. Now, also, um, I wanted to mention very quickly before I go on to my next topic, um, McGuire Air Force Base is huge. I was at the air show with you, and I was blown away. Um, what is the significance of McGuire, not just for military, but also for commercial aviation? Because we've seen like Atlas Air come in there, we've seen Evergreen come in there. What would you consider to be the significance 
of having such aircraft coming into an Air Force base? Well, basically, you know, a lot of times we can't get, you know, military, per I mean, flights for cargo for the Gulf, so they sometimes we'll probably have to charter cargo flights from civilian companies because the C-5s or the C-17s are already out of, you know, the country, so. And also, you know, McGuire's, the, the most important thing in McGuire is the 305th Air Mobility Command, which, you know, that also across the river in Dover, they have their Air Mobility Command, but basically, you know, it's mobility for McGuire. You know, Atlantic City, New Jersey has the 177th Fighter Wing, that's, you know, Air National Guard, but they have the F-16s, you know, they scramble and they basically patrol the East Coast. And McGuire, like Dover, they're from like home mobility. And, you know, I don't know if anybody has ever seen the actual terminal in McGuire for but the passenger terminal, but it's pretty cool in there. Absolutely, absolutely. I've seen it. It is an amazing place. Now, also, I want to brief um, our listeners and our viewers. Um, this week, there was a plane crash in Durango, Mexico, involving an Aero Mexico Embraer 190. Um, there were 103 passengers on board. All of them survived. This crash was significant because of weather. We've discussed it on ourselves, amongst ourselves, me and AJ. Microbursts. The significance of microbursts, I can't say enough, the dangers of flying in thunderstorms and in inclement weather. Do you, in your personal opinion, feel that Aeromexico is liable and, sh well, not so much liable, do you feel that they should not have gone up in this weather? I mean, you know what, a lot of times you never know between tech from like pull pushback to, you know, to you know rolling down the runway you never know the weather could change in a second like that but i believe that you know the tower is the one that mainly these they see the what the changing of the weather pattern ahead of time they should have told warned the plane not to take off for at least a couple of minutes to hold off for a little bit so really you know you want to put the blame on me i can't i mean yeah the pilot they should also had a warning you know in their cockpit you know like a thunderstorm warning you know for you know like serious weather but, I mean, you can't really blame anybody. I mean, you just have to just say, well, it was a, you know, they all got out alive and, you know, thankfully, you know, nothing happened. But anything can, happens with the weather. You can't just turn it off and, and, you know, say no more rain, no more thunderstorm, you know, so. Absolutely. <laughs> Lastly, I want to brief our viewers. Um, Mason Andrews, who is 18 years, four months old, is attempting to do what no other teenager his age would ever attempt to do, and that is fly around the world solo. He currently has made it across the pond, which is a very significant accomplishment, for he's the youngest person to ever do that. He is following in the footsteps of Charles Lindbergh. He is right now currently outside approaching the Russian area, Russian airspace, I believe. He is going to be going towards the Asian Peninsula and then onwards towards Oceania and then back towards the United States. He's doing a, a true circumnavigation of the globe. He's currently over Europe. I don't exactly know the exact spot. I can guesstimate given the fact that he's flying a Piper Saratoga, which is a high performance aircraft. He's somewhere between England, I want to say around England, maybe even further out from there. But we wish you nothing but the very best. You are an amazing inspiration to everyone involved in this field. And you are doing something that no one else would dare attempt. I, I know when I was your age, I dreamt of doing something like this, but I could never see myself actually doing it. You're actually doing it. We are so proud of you. And we hope to meet you when you land in, in Louisiana, your home state. You know, when I saw this story in the Post a couple weeks ago, I said to myself, when I present this to Rich, this is going to be the greatest segment he's ever done. You know, because a lot of times we talk about aviation, unfortunately you talk about plane crashes and things are negative. And, you know, just in life in general, when we talk about teens, a lot of the stories are negative about bullying and, and you know, drug overdoses and those type of things. And here you have a story about an 18-year-old teen uh, Mason Andrews, Louisiana, embarking on something so spectacular. Um, it's so riveting, and what I love about the story is it has legs, is that you could follow and chart his progress, but uh, um, I'm sure that the state of Louisiana is so proud of Mason Andrews, and it's really fascinating and riveting, uh, Rich, to follow his progress. 
He's a modern day Charles Lindbergh. That's the only way I can I can I can say it. And a modern day Amelia Earhart, exactly, AJ. He's a modern day Amelia Earhart. What he's doing is something that Amelia attempted, others attempted, but the technology just wasn't there where we could accurately pull something like this off. Now, of course, we're in the 21st century. You have modern GPS, you have global positioning satellites, you have sophisticated computers, avionics, the whole nine yards. And from what I understand, they updated his aircraft significantly for this flight. I mean, the spirit of Louisiana is living up to its reputation. I mean, you had the spirit of St. Louis, now you have the spirit of Louisiana. So, I agree very, very heartily that this is an emotional story and an inspirational one at that, and we're going to follow it. And AJ, uh, being an aviation enthusiast, what's your feeling about uh, young Mace Andrews and the, and the incredible journey he's embarking on? Well, as you were pointing it out, you hear a lot of negative stories about teenagers, you know, in this day and age with social media and bullying. But you know what? This makes me proud of our generation. This kid makes me proud because he's attempting someone. He's, he's living the dream. He's in the air. He's in the sky. He's living the dream, you know. I mean, and I hope and I pray that he makes it back safely, you know, whenever he gets back. But, you know, I'm proud. Not only that, but as an American, as an American teenager. So God bless this kid. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, it's a wonderful story, but it's really, and this should be pointed out, it's a total team effort. Um, you gotta, you got to give kudos to his parents for uh, supporting him, allowing him to take this journey. And also, very importantly, his flight instructors, uh, people that have worked with him for hours preparing for this journey. So it's just a wonderful story, and, and Rich, we'll keep following it on a weekly basis. Absolutely, Howie, we'll keep following it. We're gonna follow you along, Mason, so Godspeed to you, buddy, Godspeed. Okay, great job, Rich and AJ.